The onset of the Great Depression transformed American conservatism. Following a decade of minimal government and widespread prosperity, President Hoover and the Republican Party found themselves forced onto the defensive in the fallout from the Wall Street crash. After losing the election of 1932, they looked with horror on the New Deal, fearing that Franklin Roosevelt would centralize federal power in a way comparable to the rising European tyrants, Mussolini, Stalin and Hitler. Widespread unemployment and a pervasive sympathy for the suffering of vulnerable citizens, meanwhile, cost H. L. Mencken much of his old popularity. His jibes and jests now seemed more heartless than amusing. A handful of isolated elitists, such as Albert J. Nock and Ralph Adams Cram, nevertheless continued to argue against democracy. While Hitler's power increased and the Second World War began, American conservatives argued whether the United States should stand behind Britain in the defense of European civilization, or whether it should remain aloof from a conflict in which America had no vital interest. After losing the presidency in the election of 1932, Herbert Hoover wrote and spoke extensively against the encroachment of federal power. In his earlier career, Hoover had been a progressive Republican rather than a member of the old guard. He'd never been closely associated with people like Henry Cabot Lodge or Elihu Root. He was the most widely travelled of all the presidents up to that time and had spent many of the formative years of his career working abroad as a mining engineer and then a very, very talented businessman. And he'd given to the United States extremely distinguished service during the First World War. He was in London when the war began in 1914 and he helped to repatriate Americans caught in France, particularly France and Belgium, by the outbreak of the war. He was then involved in Belgian famine relief between 1914 and 1917, helping Belgians on whose land the war was taking place to be fed. Then he ran the Food Administration in Washington DC under President Wilson and he was very efficient indeed at running a big government department. Ironically, he thought it was okay during wartime because emergency conditions made government intervention in the economy appropriate in the way it would not be at other times. He then under undertook a massive uh, expedition for famine relief to Central and Eastern Europe during the post-war era. He was Secretary of Commerce for Presidents Harding and Coolidge. But uh, although he got a progressive reputation, still he was a great believer in the American tradition of rugged individualism. That in the end, he said, what makes America great is the self-reliance of its citizens. In a, in a speech called Rugged Individualism, which he gave many times in election campaigns and then around the country in the 1930s, he emphasized the need for self-government, decentralization and self-reliance. The war government, he said, had been only a temporary expedient. Over 150 years, we have builded up a form of self-government and we have builded up a social system which is peculiarly our own. It differs fundamentally from all others in the world. It is the American system. It is just as definite and positive a political and social system as has ever been developed on Earth. It is founded upon the conception that self-government can be can be preserved only by decentralization of government in the state and by fixing local responsibility. But further than this, it is founded upon the social conception that only through ordered liberty, freedom and equal opportunity to the individual will his initiative and enterprise drive the march of progress. During the war, by which he means the first war, during the war, we necessarily turned to, to the government to solve every difficult economic problem. The government having absorbed every energy of our people to war, there was no other solution. For the preservation of the state, the government became a centralized despotism, which undertook responsibilities, assumed powers, exercised rights, and took over the business of citizens. To a large degree, we regimented our whole people temporarily into a socialistic state. However justified it was in time of war, if continued in peacetime, it would destroy not only our system, but progress and freedom in our own country and throughout the world. 
Well, as president, as the depression worsened between 1929 and 32, Hoover took cautious steps to remedy depression conditions. But he, but he refused on principled grounds to pay direct relief from the federal government to the unemployed. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the RFC, led Franklin Roosevelt to campaign against Hoover for overspending in the campaign of 1932, which is itself evidence that the New Deal, the far higher spending regime which was to follow, was not pre-planned. As the New Deal came in after Hoover's defeat, Hoover was horrified by it. He deplored these power shifts. And the New Deal was indeed innovative in at least five ways. First of all, the federal government began to offer relief and work programs directly to individual citizens living in the states. Second, federal supervision of business uh, became much closer than ever before. The Securities and Exchange Commission was founded as a way of trying to prevent the kind of chaotic activities on the stock market which had contributed to the bubble and then the uh, Wall Street crash. The anti-monopoly laws were suspended by the National Recovery Administration, which tried to organise all the different industries to accept codes to prevent um, cutthroat competition, which might drive more businesses out of, out of operation. The federal government went into business directly, particularly with the Tennessee Valley Authority, the great hydroelectric dam building and electricity generating schemes, which for the first time saw the government competing with the private sector to provide electricity. For the first time, great subsidies were offered to farmers, subsidies which were particularly controversial because they were subsidies paid to farmers to not plant certain crops, the idea being to induce shortages and therefore to raise prices. Trade unions got enhanced legal protection under the terms of the Wagner Act of 1935 to give them a stronger bargaining position when they were face to face against their employers. Now, historians from the New Deal right up to the present have disputed whether the New Deal was, its, was actually very ad hoc or whether it had been highly planned. And they disagree about whether it saved capitalism, in which, in which case even that could be seen of as a kind of conservative uh, gesture, or whether the New Deal was a severe challenge against capitalism. Hoover himself protested against the New Deal in the name of liberalism. And it's important at this point to pause for a second to think about the changed meaning of the word liberal. In the early 19th century, liberalism favoured maximising individual liberty, particularly economic liberty. But by the uh, early 20th century, and particularly by the time of the New Deal, it was starting to come to mean using the state to promote equality and welfare and high employment and health and education. Exactly the kinds of things which Hoover protested against in the speech, rugged individualism. So it's in the 1930s that the word liberal itself starts to take on a new meaning. And it's a meaning, the new meaning is one which has, has been retained up to the present. So that since the 1930s, liberals have tended to be more sympathetic to big government projects. Hoover was afraid that Roosevelt might become a potential European style dictator. In Central Europe, the march of socialist and fascist dictatorships and their destruction of liberty did not set out with guns and armies, he wrote. Dictators began their ascent to the seats of power through the elections provided by liberal institutions. They offered the mirage of utopia to those in distress. They flung the poison of class hatred. That was itself, a, that last remark was a rebuke to FDR for his language of class antagonism. Roosevelt was a very accomplished orator and knew how to uh, insinuate that the rich were living at the expense of the poor in the Depression days. Well, Hoover was again alarmed by Franklin Roosevelt's attempt to tamper with the Supreme Court. Roosevelt was indignant when the Supreme Court found that the National Recovery Administration and many other parts of the New Deal laws, which had been brought into force in 1933 and 34, were challenged and were found by the Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. As I mentioned before, four of the Supreme Court justices sitting in the early days of the New Deal had been appointed by President Harding back in the early 1920s, and they also tended to be Conservatives who were unsympathetic to the direction the New Deal was taking. So Roosevelt proposed to increase the number of justices sitting in the Supreme Court up to a maximum of 15, 
For a very long time there had been nine, but the Constitution had never specified exactly how many there ought to be. Now, Hoover saw this as a barefaced attempt to politicise the court. And so it was. In a speech in San Diego against the idea, which became a conservative classic, Hoover traced the whole history of American rights and liberties all the way back to the Magna Carta and then through the American Revolution. These rights were no sudden discovery, no overnight inspiration. They were established by centuries of struggle in which men died fighting bitterly for their recognition. Their beginnings lie in the Magna Carta of Runnymede, 570 years before the Constitution was written down. Through the centuries, the habeas corpus, the petition of rights, the declaration of rights, the growth of the fundamental maxims of the common law marked their expansion and security. Our forefathers migrated to America that they might attain them more fully. When they wrote the Declaration of Independence, they boldly extended these rights. Before the Constitution could be ratified, patriotic men who feared a return to tyranny, whose chains had been thrown off only after years of toil and bloody war, insisted that these hard-won rights should be incorporated in the black and white within the Constitution. And so came the American Bill of Rights. Many Conservative Democrats were also horrified by Roosevelt's court-packing plan. They, they saw it as a, a direct affront to the Constitution itself. And so Roosevelt was forced to back away from this idea, even though he'd just won a big re-election victory in the election of 1936. Robert Taft, unblemished by defeat, became the leader of the Senate Conservatives in the later days of the New Deal. Taft was an Ohio Republican, son of the president who'd succeeded Theodore Roosevelt. William Howard Taft had become president in the election of 1908, immediately after Theodore Roosevelt, and his son, Robert, was now the, uh, was becoming the Senate leader of the Republicans. He was immensely hardworking, sober, humorless, but the master of the issues. He won a seat in the Senate in 1938 and became a new conservative leader in Washington. He agreed with Hoover that a centralised economy was antithetical to American traditions. And here's a passage from one of Taft's speeches. He said it would be absolutely contrary to the whole American theory on which this country was founded and which has actually made it the most prosperous country in the world. It is inconsistent with democratic government. Communism, fascism and Hitlerism have destroyed a system like ours in many European countries and substituted a form of despotic socialism. As far as we can judge, socialism will not work. There is no man and no group of men intelligent enough to coordinate and control the infinitely numerous and complex problems involved in the production, consumption and daily lives of 120 million individualistic and educated people. In other words, the sheer complexity of our society makes planning either impossible or, with its restrictions, tyrannical. Now, at the end of that speech, he expressed a point that would become central to post-World War II conservatives. Socialism is not only oppressive, it's also bound to be economically hopeless, very, very inefficient. Because no centralised bureaucracy can possibly know enough, quickly enough, to organise an entire nation's economy. The invisible hand of the market does it far better and in a far, far less repressive way. Well, the critique of democracy and mass society, voiced by American conservatives ever since the era of the Federalists, could still be heard even in the 1930s from Albert J. Nock and from Ralph Adams Cram. Not people who are politically important, but people whose ideas can still resonate, at least for some people. Nock wrote a book called Our Enemy the State, an impassioned plea on behalf of decentralised government, and it's become a libertarian classic. His autobiography, The Memoirs of a Superfluous Man, published in 1943, also became a kind of cult classic among libertarians, very influential to the next generation of conservatives. The young William F. Buckley Jr., about whom I'll say much more in subsequent lectures, said that it was his favourite book as a teenager. That itself is a demonstration that he must have been a very unusual teenager. Well, Nock argued 
that he'd become superfluous. There was no room for him in the democratic world because he said he was too good for the world. He dismissed most people as being really unworthy even of the name of human beings. He wrote, they are merely the subhuman raw material out of which the occasional human being is produced. This was the same kind of sneering and yet wickedly amusing tone that H.L. Mencken had used. And in fact, the two men were mutual admirers. Knox sometimes wrote for Mencken's American Mercury in the 1920s. He said once he realised that most uh, people couldn't really be described as human beings at all, this had made him more tolerant of other people's horribleness. In one famous passage he writes, After all, one has a great affection for one's dogs, even when one sees them reveling in tastes and smells that are unspeakably odious. In other words, you can't hold it against so many people that they're really not human beings. They're just living up to the nature they've got, even though it's not really a human nature. He was a, a deliberately provoking writer in, uh, in many ways. His biography has shown that the book, though ostensibly about his own life, Memoirs of a Superfluous Man, misses out massive areas of his experience, such as that at first earlier in life he'd been a minister, and that he was married, and that he had children. None of these things uh, appears in the pages of the book. Nock was very good at inverting the age's conventional wisdom. For example, he thought that universal literacy was a terrible mistake because, he said, it en enabled unscrupulous leaders to deceive pathetic, ordinary people. Quote, it enables scoundrels to beset, dishevel and debauch such intelligence as is in the power of the vast majority of mankind to exercise, permitting mediocrity and sub-mediocrity to run rampant to the detriment of both intelligence and taste. He was thinking particularly there of advertising and the way it, it's, it's systematically deceptive in its intentions. And of course, as literacy had risen, so had the advertising business. Ralph Adams Cram shared Knox's belief that most people have no capacity for self-government or sustained thought, and that society ought to be organised to prevent them from doing harm. We met Cram earlier in the course. Uh, he was one of the anti-modernists of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and he looked back nostalgically to the Middle Ages, to the great Gothic architecture, which in his view was the greatest building style ever achieved. And he was also a practicing and, and excellent Gothic architect. In Cram's view, America had had its golden age at the beginning of the Republic in the 1790s. He praised what he called the old selective aristocratic republic, controlled and directed by men of tradition, education, inherited culture and exalted ideals, which had produced such noble instruments of government as the Constitution of the United States. And, for a certain length of time, it fulfilled the high anticipations of its creators. But, he said, this great edifice had been debased by the arrival of mass democracy, personified in Andrew Jackson. The vast riches acquired by industrial barons after the Civil War had degraded and coarsened American life. And that coarsening, that degradation could be seen in modern architecture. Now another place where Cram is very interesting is in his writings about modern art. As I mentioned earlier, he's unusual because he was not only a practicing art artist and architect, but also someone who wrote a lot about them and theorized about their significance. Cram saw modern art as self-indulgent, and he thought of the cult of the artist, the artistic genius, as completely mistaken. You probably know that uh, late 19th and 20th century artists loved the idea of themselves as brave rebels who were um, pioneers of the avant-garde in reaction against society and drawing on the reserves of their own great genius to challenge a complacent bourgeois society. Uh, artists themselves had a cult of their own individualism. Well, Cram was dismayed by all this. He thought of art and architecture not as the expression of the alienated soul, but rather, in a healthy society particularly, as the healthy expression of a community's um, self-awareness. He wrote, Art is an expression not of the personal reactions of highly specialised individuals, but of something that is almost communal, even racial in its nature. 
This is true. If it were not, I should reject it from, as my subject. For I have scant sympathy with that entirely modern view of art, which makes the artist a rebel against constituted society, an abnormal phenomenon, feeding upon his inner self, cut off from the life of his fellows, and issuing his aesthetic manifestos in flaming defiance. Not so did the art of Greece, of Byzantium, of the Middle Ages come into being and relate itself to life. Like Henry James, he thought of skyscrapers, the distinctive buildings of the American cities in the early 20th century, as soulless commercial tributes to America at its worst, utterly inhuman in scale, objects that bullied rather than adorned their surroundings. Another influential figure to conservatives in the 1930s was the Spanish philosopher José Ortega y Gasset. His book, The Revolt of the Masses, was published in Spain in 1930 and an influential English translation came out in 1932. As its title suggests, The Revolt of the Masses, it sounded a cautionary note about the rising power of the masses of the population. Ortega was a philosophy professor in Madrid and he was a member of the Spanish Parliament of the early 1930s in the frail Spanish Republic that was soon swept away by the Spanish Civil War of 1936-39. to This book became a classic to conservatives, particularly after the Second World War, because it warned that while the masses of people had gained rights and had gained wealth and had gained access to the amenities of civilization, they were not developing a commensurate sense of responsibility. Ortega says, the masses are running a world that they do not really understand. In the 1930s, conservatives divided on the question of how best to respond to fascism and how to respond particularly to the rise of Hitler, with significant numbers taking the isolationist point of view. There was a lot of uncertainty about the meaning of the word fascism, and at first the, whole, the, the idea had a limited appeal among conservatives in the early 1930s. What did fascism mean? Did it mean simply fervent nationalism? or fervent anti-communism? If so, strong government conservatives might very well like it. The old joke was that Mussolini, for the first time in Italian history, made the trains run on time. And an American conservative historian named Ross Hoffman went to Rome in 1935 and found that it was true. He disliked the theatrical aspect of Mussolini's uh, leadership but he admitted that there was a new purposefulness to Italian life which he hadn't noticed before. And he speculated that a depression-stricken America might need, quote, a constructive revolution in behalf of authority, order and justice. That wasn't an endorsement of fascism, but it was certainly an approximation to seeing potentially the point of it. Similarly, the new humanist Irving Babbitt noted that America might need a Mussolini of its own, to prevent the rise of an American Lenin. And it's possible that he was thinking about Roosevelt as a potential American Lenin, the all-powerful central figure. Well, if there was some doubt about the significance of fascism, there was much less doubt about Soviet communism, which American conservatives had hated right from the start. Herbert Hoover opposed Roosevelt's decision to give diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union in 1933. The Russian Revolution had begun in 1917, but both President Wilson and then his three Republican successors, Harding, Coolidge and Hoover, had all declined to normalise diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. They regarded it as a, a rogue state, in effect. Hoover had been there, he'd been in the early Soviet Union as the revolution was just beginning and had been horrified by the brutality of Stalin as he secured his power. Hoover wrongly anticipated the rapid decline of communism in the 1930s. He said, Marxian socialism is a dying faith. The gigantic experiment in socialism in Russia is now devouring its own children and shedding rivers of blood. Well, it was true that the revolution was devouring its own children as the old Bolsheviks were put on trial one by one. And it was true that tens of thousands, possibly millions of people were dying in Russia, the extermination of the Kulaks and the terrible uh, famines of the early five-year plans. 
But the Soviet communism was going to have more vitality than uh, Hoover had bargained, which is why it took till the end of the 1980s for it finally to perish. American opinion split over the Spanish Civil War, which was one of the great geopolitical events of the late 1930s. American Catholics strongly favoured Franco, Francisco Franco, the army general, who launched a coup against the Republic. Why? Well, because Franco posed as the saviour of the Catholic Church. There were many incidents of priests and nuns being massacred by radicals on the Republican side. American Catholics called Franco the George Washington of Spain. Most Americans on the left, on the other hand, were fervently enthusiastic about the, the Republic. The Abraham Lincoln Brigade was a group of American volunteers, many of them American communists, who went to fight on the side of the Republic against Franco. It's interesting, isn't it, that both sides, the right and the left, tried to bring to bear the reputation of legendary figures in American history, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, in their thinking about what was going on in Spain. And in fact, of course, the American analogies were very poor in both cases. The best way to get the feeling of the outlook of the left is by reading Ernest Hemingway's great novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls, which is about a, an American volunteer in the service of the Republic. Charles Lindbergh's leadership gave popular credibility to the isolationist cause once the Second World War began, at least until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The Second World War began in September 1939, and it intensified the debate going on inside the United States about what the appropriate American response should be towards fascism. The claim was commonly made in the 1930s that the First World War, the Great War, had been fought not to make the world safe for democracy, as Wilson said, but to benefit the munitions makers. There was a great wave of cynicism in the early 1930s, and even congressional investigations which purported to show that a conspiracy of the munitioners had dragged America into the war. And so the mood among isolationists was, we've got to make sure that we don't again get um, hoodwinked into going to war, especially because it's a war which involves the old European powers tearing themselves to pieces, and there can't really be vital American interests at stake. Let's go back, said the isolationists, to the philosophy embedded in Washington's farewell address. That gives us the best guidance, no entangling alliances. In the late 1930s, the America First Committee, which was America's leading isolationist organization, won some sympathetic attention from conservative Republicans like Herbert Hoover and Robert Taft. Taft pointed out that the First World War had not made the world safe for democracy and had not ended all wars. And he was particularly afraid that Franklin Roosevelt would consolidate absolute power if America joined the war. To win, the United States would have to succumb to what Taft called an absolute arbitrary government in Washington, in which the federal government would take over business and regulate every detail of private and commercial life. That was the great dread. Uh, Roosevelt's power was bad enough even in peacetime during the Depression and during the New Deal. He'd shown his unscrupulousness at the time of trying to pack the Supreme Court, and now he was going to use the pretext of war to consolidate his grip on American life. The historian Justin Raimondo, who's himself a libertarian, has this comment to make about the unusual character of the, of the isolationists. He writes, The isolationist old right represented a distinctly American phenomenon, which owed nothing to the old world and was in all essential ways the exact opposite of its European counterpart. It was a nationalism of an unprecedented kind, based not on blood and soil and the need to expand, but on a tendency towards introversion, an impulse to draw back from the world and its endless quarrels. Well, in the event, that's a very shrewd comment, but in the event, isolationism was nullified by Pearl Harbor. After the Japanese surprise attack in December of 1941, there was no doubt that America would go to war. Although even then there was the residual question, should America go to war just against Japan, which alone had attacked America, or should America go to war against Japan and its ally Germany? In the end, Hitler solved that problem for the Americans by himself declaring war against America. Had he not done so, the debate inside the United States would have been far more intense 
and the outcome of the war itself might very well have been different. So it was one of Hitler's several very momentous mistakes.